Uh, my name is Dimitri Broxton. I'm the Senior Director of Education for Museum of the African Diaspora. And this is In the Artist Studio with Mansur Narula. Uh, Moad's physical building is currently closed as we undergo a refresh of our galleries, but you can still get your fill of art and artists of the African diaspora. Twice a month, join my colleague Elena Gross and myself as we visit some of our favorite artists in their studios to see what they're currently working on. This is a rare opportunity to hear from artists directly from their studios. We follow all of our talks with an audience Q&A. So if you're joining us on Zoom, you'll see the little icon at the bottom with the Q&A. As we go through the conversation today, we invite you to enter your questions. We get to those in the last 15 minutes of every conversation. So please just as questions come up for you, put them in there. We also wanna hear from you throughout. So please use the chat feature to share your ideas, your reactions, converse with each other. Uh, we invite you to do that. But again, questions, if you want me to ask Mansoor at the end live, please put them in the Q&A. If you're on Facebook, also put them in the comments and we'll get to those as well. Um, please visit our website to see which artists we have coming up. You can also go back and watch all of our past talks on the MOAD YouTube channel. So look up Museum of the African Diaspora on YouTube, as well as our Facebook channel. This series was made possible by a generous donation by the Westridge Foundation, MOAD members, and all of you. Thank you so much. I'm going to go through a couple of statements before I introduce my esteemed guest today. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Dante Wright, Micaiah Bryant, and the countless numbers of others who have lost their lives at the hands of police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. MOAD's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say their names, to hold space, and honor these victims. Moad also acknowledges that all non-native people to this land are descended from settler occupiers or those who were brought against their will. Moad occupies the unceded land of the Ramatush Ohlone people and we pay our respects to the Ohlone people and their elders, both past and present. Uh, for more information about the native inhabitants of your land, we invite you to visit www.native-land.ca. My guest today is Mansoor Nurula, who currently lives in San Francisco, California. Nurula's practice involves creating topographical textile sculptures and wall work from discarded fabrics. Born in Chicago, Nurula grew up understanding the city through public transportation and walking, a habit he continued in his previous work as a taxi driver and today as he travels through San Francisco on his bicycle. His intricate works recall these travels and navigations, referencing both his own physical path through the city, as well as his life journey as an artist and school counselor. Narula has been an artist in residency at Recology San Francisco and the San Francisco Planning Department, courtesy of the San Francisco Arts Commission. Mansur had, uh, has had solo and group exhibitions at Guerrero Gallery, Incline Gallery, Peace Industries, Dependable Letterpress, 801 Gallery, and with the Mending Collective at Chandra Cerrito Gallery. Uh, Mansoor, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to be in conversation with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was, I was listening. I was processing all that. Thank you. I'm present. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. How's everything going with you? Oh, uh, well, you know, uh, just uh, ready to be here. Um, and just thinking about the power of, what, of the intro, it was just good to remind, thank you, just of uh, where we are. Yes, uh, definitely our location. And your, and your work has so much to do with location. Yeah, man, I'm trying, it's about being, for me, being here and being now, where, being here right now, uh, where I was, oftentimes like where I'm going. Yes, yes, yes. I love, I love that. I love that. I wanna, I wanna just jump right out um, and talk to you about bike biking. I mean, you got this, this Jameis bikes box <laughs> right behind you, <laughs> and I know biking is 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 an important aspect of just your life. Um, so I, I know this was not on the prepared questions, what but the? Hey, you know, <laughs> just... my assistant. I can't. Hey, what's going on? <laughs> I got to sign up for this. Um, <laughs> uh, where do you want me to start? Do you want me to start with the story? Do you want me to, what, what do you want me to do? 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm open for it all stories for okay. sure. But you okay. know, bike, biking seems so important to you. I'll keep it short. I'll keep it short because I can be loquacious, and I, I'm sure someone's gonna text and be like, "Wrap it up." <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I. It's. I mean, okay. I'm gonna do the first thought that came to mind. It's. I just remember just as a little, as a small child, like seven years old, growing up in Chicago, just like, it just was like independence. It was like all of a sudden, like I can go around the block versus needing to be my friends or I ask for permission. And just my father, like telling me like, hey, you need to watch out. Kids are gonna ask you to ride your bike. Don't let anyone ride your bike because they're gonna take it, you know? But um, yeah, it's always been about independence. I've been about like, even when I was in high school or like junior high school, like, a bike meant like I could go to Chicago State, which was only like two miles away, but it was like all of a sudden the whole South Side is open, you know, and just, it was just amazing. Just like letting the bike lead or with my friends and like playing all, all kinds of games with the bikes. I don't know. I just always been a little bike. So I'm a little. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's not a prop. That's a real a bike that a friend of mine sent me from uh, New Mexico. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I understand biking is important for you and, and your, your uh, new chosen home of San Francisco as well. Yeah, it is. It's, it's funny. Even the way I came here to the Bay Area was because of bikes. It was um, after I got from University of New Mexico, um, I was kind of like, just no, didn't know, got a little lost, didn't know where I was going. And I was really, got really into bike racing. And so... Hmm. Um, well, first I was mountain biking and then a friend of mine, Tim, got me into cyclocross and then road racing. And then the first season, like I think the first season I raced, raced road, I like, I did like 40 race, 40 racing days, something like that, 30 to 40 racing days. And wow. it, it was like 23. One day we traveled out here to do the Exeter road race up in Santa Rosa. I think it's Exeter and Santa Rosa. And then the next weekend was a series of stage race in Visalia. And I just remember like the moment I got off the plane in Oakland and like, even though I was living in Albuquerque at the time, I was like, I want to live here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm serious. It was like, because originally I was planning to go to Portland to do some bike racing, mm. but just some things changed and I wanted to come in here with him. And then I was like, I want to live here. And my friend, we were like, cause we were, he was like almost a pro. I was just starting. And I just remember like he wanted to sit around and like rest his legs, you know, cause he was like really serious, you know, like when you're racing, you want to keep your legs fresh and we'll go on training rides and stuff. And I was like, I want to explore. And he's like, you sure? And I was like, yeah, let's do that like and explore. And I just remember, right, we're staying with a friend Bridge and um, in West Oakland, near Adeline and I think 32nd. And I was just like riding around. And I was like, this is amazing. I want to live here. So yada 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 long story short i wound up here like a year and a half later it took me a little while that is <laughs> awesome and, and it's, it's been quite a while now right is, oh my is what God. I that was another lifetime ago that was when i was like i moved here when i was 24 26 you know so and and that's kind of been a constant whether i've like i stopped racing bikes probably like when i was in my late 20s early 30s um but i've always had a bike like even if it was like all of a sudden like now i mainly use it to commute um, so mm -hmm. there. like uh, yesterday I rode my bike for probably an hour and 45 minutes with a new friend um, yeah so now it's more like commuting like riding after work just processing all the stuff I experience at work so yeah it's been a constant that's, yeah that's that's awesome so so it also in addition to uh, transportation it seems like it's also kind of a, a form of self-care for you yeah self-care and also like bonding connection yeah just all these things so the the that's a whole thing is the ecology of friendship. And like one of the things we adapt to, or one of the one of the adjustments I made over COVID was just like being open. And the person I rode with yesterday was a person, like when I went to get vaccinated, I had so much anxiety about being vaccinated. And I remember mm. seeing this um, young, young black man waiting in line and he had a Chrome bag and he had a Chicago flag on his Chrome bag. And I, I don't know, you know, he was like, well, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we just started talking and he's like from he grew up going he's like 20 years younger than me but he grew up um like a block away from where i went to high school and wow and his grandmother still lives in that neighborhood and just like his awareness critical thinker like it was like oh yeah cool new friend so he he's new to cycling so i was like let me show you around so we've been going on like these weekly routes and that's something we've been doing throughout throughout COVID. That is incredible. That is incredible. I mean, I was going to ask you, you know, how this last year and a half has been for you. You know, I mean, 
you know, in terms of your practice as an artist, but also your work with students um, and, 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 you know, all of your projects, how, what's, what's, what's been going on for you this, for this last year and a half, which I can't believe I'm saying. Yeah, I know. I'm like, that's, I'm like, it feels like it was 10 years. It's been like 10 years. <laughs> Seriously. So I, I feel like this was like a, for me, it was, like I said, I want to say like giving thanks, like you did earlier in the program. Like I want to, I want to give thanks. I'm, I'm thankful that I had a job. I'm thankful that I have a place to live. I'm thankful that I have a studio. Um, I'm thankful I'm alive, you know? Um, but I think during this time it was like, it was just the opportunity. It was like, well, not opportunity. It presented me with lots of opportunities to make some changes, you know? Um, but they were kind of like, I think most of the changes that happened in my life, they aren't really voluntary, you know what I mean? yeah. <laughs> no. <Yeah. laughs> so this was like, hey, yo, um, it's hard working with students. It was like, I was on Zoom calls at one point last school year, I was on Zoom calls from like eight o'clock in the morning and to some days like seven, eight o'clock wow. at night. And, and so the last thing I wanted to do was to, hey, come to this space, which is also inside. So um, even though I had some like responsibility, I had like a couple of commissions and I had this thing for the playing department, I had to kind of like, changed the way I was working because it was like, it was just so much pressure and like being inside wasn't healthy for me. So one of the things I started doing, like there was, some, I mean, I'll give you the short of it. One of the things I started doing was again, like remembering to see, because I realized seeing, looking, exploring, like having a sense of wonder, those are the things that kind of like nourish me and kind of ground me. And so one of the things I started doing was um, early in the pandemic after leaving my, my house, after being on Zoom calls and coming down here, I was noticing like in May, all those moving vans, right? All there was like moving mm. every block. I remember on page, it would be like, oh, wait a second, they're like six moving vans. And this, that was one of the things I was processing, but then it wasn't until June, I started noticing all these empty apartments. And so one of the things, another practice I did was, again, it kind of made me sick as a result was going around and documenting all these empty apartments. And I started like an Instagram page called NTSF. And I was, oh, wow. yeah, I was documenting mapping and, and, but again, over time, that was something that was making me ill because these are empty spots, but I still, I can't find a place to live that I can afford to live in. I'm still living yeah. with housemates, you know what I mean? So, so it was like, okay, I gotta stop this. This is not working. And so then other pivots that happened as well were um, going to the Black Lives Matters protests. I went to three and I ran to Chris Solars and then seeing him over and again, I knew him peripherally, but after going to a bunch and talking, he found out that I was into, I'd just gotten an iPad and I downloaded some um, beat making software on it. And he was like, you want to make beats? And he always asked me and I was like, ah, I don't know about that, you know, I don't know. And then finally I said, yes. And then we started making beats like every week on Wednesday would be produce different spots near the water. And I was making beats. So that became another way that I like, that's another way I kind of adapted. It's like not art or not what people think, but it was another way of like, saving myself you know what i mean because it was so stressful so that is that is incredible so so we've got artist counselor biker navigator producer, <laughs> producer. <laughs> i mean hey no no, no 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 i mean you never you never i would love to see those all come together i mean yeah. particularly with That's the visual I, art i would like to do because i feel like even though I'm really into beats, I'm like beats obsessed. I love repetition. I like to run house, you know, I love it. But um, I, for, I have had made, I've tried like some slower ambient things and I mm. would like to integrate like a auditory component. Cause in some of my work, there's already like a olfactory component, but it was oh. like, in terms of place, like sound is so important, like smell. So just thinking about like, these are some things to think about. I've talked about, I have some work now at Ray Branson, but we're talking with them about like, okay, what are some uh, auditory elements I can bring in? Because I feel like all the pieces do have soundtracks because when I'm making these pieces in the studio, I mean, they're like inputs because there's like the wind blowing, trees outside, construction downstairs, people walking up and down the stairs. I usually have a radio. Sometimes I have a radio, radio with words and I have a radio with music. <laughs> so there are all these inputs and I feel like there's a soundtrack that not, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm recording one, but I'm also going to be producing one because all these things happening at the same time. So... Yeah. That is it. That's incredible. Wait, wait, wait. So, so are you now represented by a gallery? Is that? I'm, just showing, I'm showing. You're showing there. Okay. I'm showing a gallery. They they were generous and and came by for a studio visit. They were like, 
can we show some of your work? And I was like, sure. Yeah. That okay. is incredible. Oh, it's so, so that that's coming up soon. Uh, it's right now. It's a show about plastics. So basically the, the, um, all the, my work, most of the, the, the material is, was dumpstered. So, uh, the Cordura, it's like outdoor, outdoor fabric that's used in like stuff like this, like messenger yeah. bags. Um, it's all plastic basically. Um, and so, uh, one of the first things I, what was this like in 2007, even before I had a studio, I remember dropping a passenger off on 16th in Alabama when I was, when I was driving a cab and I saw a man, Eric Zoe dumpstering. I was like, what is he? He's pulling fabric out of this dumpster. And wow. then, and then like, I don't know, because I'm a hoarder and I love trash. And so <laughs> I like, look, you told me about it. We chatted and I looked and I was like, Oh my God, look at these colors. Look at these. I'll pull out later if you want. I could pull out a band to show you like, I have so much fabric. I, I could work. I can, I can never pick again and have more than enough fabric for the rest of my life. Wow. Uh, but yeah. Wow. So like the work is all like based on plastic discards, all trash, stuff that was bound for landfill that I kind of diverted into my space. So it takes up a lot of my space. Yeah, yeah. So, so somebody, somebody just says upcycle artisanship. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, and and I don't know, people are, I'm not showing your work yet. I will get to it in just a moment, but just, uh, I mean, we do have some behind you right now, but just, okay. just, the, just thinking about the fact that this is uh, all collected, it's, it's all gathered um, through dumpster diving or reclaiming it in some kind of way. It's just, it's just wild. Um, before we get into that, no, no, no. Oh. I was like, that's part of the process. It's like I was saying, that's like exploration. And for me, it's like always like one thing I enjoyed doing when I was driving a cab was like, you're always looking, right? You, most of the time I'm looking for like, hey, is that person going to step out into the curb because they're flag? Am I, I, was, I was doing a thing because when I got into scavenging, I would like make maps of like where couches were, like leather couches right. that, I could cut up, that I could cut up. And you, you know what I mean? So it's like, but that was, that was a way that I got, one of the ways I got through that job, right? which is like, how do I make this interesting? Not just with conversation or whether well, it was reading people in the cab, but it was like mapping or just always noticing, always wondering, always being curious, always cataloging. So that's <laughs> true. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, I'm glad that you did that. Uh, so we do, we, <laughs> we, do have a, we do have a question from uh, someone on Facebook regarding your, so, someone wants to know regarding <laughs> your, um your bio why is 48 important to you i'm just gonna go off script and go with that one 48 <laughs> my age or uh, your, your age your age <laughs> um wow that's a that's a stumper uh, <laughs> oh right I, I, maybe it's important just in terms of like this is where i'm at right now like it's funny i was in albuquerque um was it like two weeks ago? I was there for three weeks, but it was like a place I hadn't really spent much time in since I was like 24, 26, so 24 t plus 24. And it was like yeah. going back, seeing a lot of people that maybe were doing the same thing. Some people were in different stages of their lives, like, but it was familiar. So it's, mm -hmm. it's funny. maybe it's like my life twice, or this could be the age. I could be that, that could be that 24. Half of that is the age of a child. If I had a child at that age, you know, when I was 20. Oh, wow. That's wild. I don't That's know, wild. I don't know, like, like, uh, eight is twice four i don't know you know mm -hmm. 48 um i don't know it's a it's a good place it's a weird place when you wake up and you're you feel you your, your bones to borrow a line from black <laughs> Live, when your bones start making that metal and metal sound you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you're like ah whoa where did that come from or uh, whoa i need to sit up straight i can feel that curve that curvature in my spine permanently forming so right uh, right that's 48 <laughs> Oh, I think there was some football player I liked that had a number 48 when I was a kid, but I can't remember right now. So I hope that's Yeah, I mean, I mean, you grew up in Southside Chicago. You know, I mean, I'll also just say so I grew up in East Oakland um, and I'm also in my 40s. And I think, you know, as as black men in America, you, you definitely got to celebrate, you know, yeah. um, I think I think hip hop artists talk about all the time that you're not even supposed to, you know, just even making it to 24 is is a miracle um, in the current society. And I think, you know, that, that that's that's something regardless of the choice in the life that you lead, just the fact that you grew up yeah. in a place like Southside of Chicago when Cabrini Green was still up and, you know, all the, the craziness was going on in that time. I think, you know, I think you got to count the blessings of, of making it. 
I, I do, like I'm very thankful, but I think I have to acknowledge like my privilege and that's what I did some work about. Yeah. Like, I did some work about, um, uh, so my, my parents were like Pan-Africans, Pan-Africanists. Um, and so I went to like alternative schools like Blyden, New Concept. Um, and so those were always like on the South side, like close to, like I said, Ida B. Wells projects. So one of the pieces Ida B. Wells is kind of like about that. It's kind of like me, mm -hmm. my, my sheltered Afrocentric life um, in contrast to seeing like, a, was a 20 story housing project, like a block away. And just mm -hmm. thinking about the opportunities I had that kids that were my age, seven, seven years old, eight years old at the time did not have, you know? So just even within our community, thinking about like my parents, both graduated from college, father has a master's degree, even it was like they chose to live on the south side, they chose mm -hmm. to live in mm -hmm. poor black neighborhoods. So, but I, I had protection, both parents, grandparents on both sides, you know, and there was a support system, you know, and always from an early age, like going to college, not, what do you mean? That's, that's not an accomplishment. That's the bare minimum, dude. <laughs> exactly. like, what are you talking about? We're not celebrating that. What are you doing that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was like that, that, that same like expectations, like, oh, what, what are you, what are you talking about? You, you, what are you doing after school? You're doing this? I, I don't think so. You think you're playing basketball? No, dude, you turn off for the fun team. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> wow. 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 Yeah, exactly. Exactly. They, they're, they're like, Hey, this is how you're going to get to the next level. Yeah. Yeah. You're not, I mean, so that, that way it's like, you're, you're on a different platform. You're on a different, you're on a different trajectory. Not saying you're, you're different or special or better than, but this, well, this is the plan we have for you. You know, mm -hmm. these are the expectations we have for and of you, you know? So that's like I said, I'm still thankful. I'm thankful to be alive because there were lots of people like us that's mm -hmm. still had their lives taken from them, right? Walking down the street, whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So like I said, I'm thankful blessed to be here. So maybe that answers the 48 question. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think so. I think you answered it on multiple different levels and you know from multiple different vantage points. Um so so yeah, thank you for going into that. <laughs> and thank you for the person who asked the question. Um, you know, because those things matter. Um, I, I'm, I'm really- Also, I was gonna say another uh, note. Uh, I usually don't answer questions directly. <laughs> so. Oh, hey, hey. <laughs> That's not the answer you're giving. Okay. <laughs> you, 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 asked, you answered it directly enough. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, I also just wonder, you know, your path. We, we hopefully have a lot of students who, who watch this program um and you know including your own students so you know what what was your path to becoming an artist and then also um you know what was your family's role in that or or their response i, I guess yeah, well. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's pretty interesting because i my my sister has uh like a what is it a five-year-old and a three-year-old now and just watching them like children love making art man. like yes. like just watching like the drawings the, the three-year-old is making like her alphabet or just these figures and you're like oh my sister's encouraging them and for me mm. I just remember like it was always supported like I always had a sketchbook I always had a sketchbook I always had big paper I always had paints I always had um my father went to an art institute so I remember going to summer camps there I remember going to like art pro summer art programs at UIC I remember going to like all kinds of workshops on art music you know playing drums when i was like seven years old african drum regular drum you know so I, I feel like my parents were very supportive of that and but also also supporting being like you need to do academic work as well mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. um when i when i think about it it's kind of like what are the what are the things we transmit to children or what do we support them with and and what are the things that kind of keep us alive and i can say that's one of the gifts that my parents gave me that i'm very very thankful from for is to like, hey, this is a thing. This is a thing that can help you. This is a thing that can, and that's what I look at my work. It's like helping me. I'm not, it's not for profit really, even though I like making money or whatever, but I'm mm -hmm. doing it for me, man. It's like, for me, storytelling feels good. It's, it's a practice. It's, it's like exercise, it's thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so both my parents always encouraged, grandparents. Yeah, so I felt like teachers in the community always, always were like, oh, you're an artist. You want to be in this thing or we you got you want to design something like my godmother was like 
even though I didn't have the skills really. She was like, can you design a logo for me? Or my dad, like, <laughs> yeah, I need a new business card. Can you design a business card for me? You know, and especially when I was, and then even when I was in graph, people doing into graffiti in the, uh, when I was like in my teenage years, people were like, you want to do a piece on the wall? You, want, you know, like it was always, always stuff. Man. So like, I feel very grateful that people saw that <clears throat> and encouraged it, you know, and gave me opportunities, you know, so. That is that that that's incredible, and that's not a story that that I hear very often when I ask this question. Um, you know, I, oftentimes folks are just like, "Yeah, they let me draw, they let me take some classes," but they're like, "That's not what you're gonna do to you know to earn a living, right?" <laughs> so it's it's awesome, um, and I, I also wonder, you know, if that you know that that whole sense of encouragement translates to your work with students, and you know, is is that also part of of my, how you ended up on that path? Um, my, it's a little different. I think mine is just like, again, it's like seeing and also like it's teaching. Like, so it's like, what's a port of entry? Like if I see mm. someone like, oh, I was like, oh, you're like, you want to try this embroidery hoop thing? You know, so it's like, what's uh, using it as a way to access, you know, and hopefully teaching them a thing or helping them, encouraging them to do a thing. Or like you do this sewing, let's, let's scale it up. Let's do, let's embroider some sweatshirts. Let's have a craft sale, you know, like, so, and just building connection. I think like over time, just seeing like, just supporting, being supportive, being present, you know, is like, that's for me, that's a huge, a huge thing that as it was in my own life, like it was so important to have friends like Jeff who, who sent me that box, everyone like that's, man, that's, that's, I don't need $1,500. I need just authentic friendship and encouragement is more, well, I mean, it's great to pay bills, but that's, that's more valuable to me. Mm -hmm, and I think that was mm -hmm. the thing for my parents too, was like these things are just things, you know, but skills and, and talent and, and these intangibles are far more important. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I love to hear that. <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share um, your work right now. So if folks just give me a second to set this up. I think I'm, I'm think I've gotten myself better at this at this point in time. Uh oh. <laughs> maybe oh. I did, maybe I did not. Hold on. How do I? This thing never wants to work, uh, cooperate with me, but you can see my screen, right? Yeah, yeah, I can see your screen. Okay, awesome. Um, so I yeah, I just, I uh, want to just, you know, let's, let's, let's jump up into here. Okay, so I don't know, I, I, I do a thing where I'm like, you know, you listen to you listen to uh, authors who are in like a book tours or whatever, and they do the same talk every time. So I'm one of those people who does the same talk. <laughs> and like, wait, wait a second. I just heard you're on forum. You're doing the, now you're doing the same talk on Commonwealth Club? Get out of here. Um, so I try to do like, say different things every time and just like really be with the moment. So the first thing that comes up with this, so this was, as you can see, it was between the years of 2008 and 2014. Um, I started this when I first got a uh, studio in this building. Uh, Dimitri and I were talking about, uh, before we start, the broadcast started, about just how important like having a physical place. Again, thankful to my landlords and Fergus and Chewy and people who, and Jason who invited me to be, have a space in this larger space. Um, but this started when I first got this space. I, I was working out of, uh, from the time I graduated until 2008, just working out of rooms, like carving out little space, like a little desk or a space to make like small things like objects, usually things for utility. And when I got a studio, um, it was $185 a month, which seemed like a lot wow. of money. Wow. You're like, oh, oh my God, I, I'm never gonna be able to pay this, you know? Um, and so when I got it, it was like important because I'm I'm very thrifty. And so like if I'm paying $170 a month for, or $80 a month for something, I got to be there doing something. And even though I didn't know what I was doing, I was like, I got some fabric. I'm going to start putting the fabric together. You know? <laughs> so I got a sewing machine um, and just zigzagged pieces of fabric together, which is like absurd because it takes so much time like it was but for me it was just like process right and then piecing little pieces of fabric starting with i started at the top and, and made it uh, work down was like for me it became this thing i just did obsessively every day before and after uh i drove a cab 
Like I only drove a car two days a week, but I was still going there. Mm. I got to do it. I got to go in and do this. And it just was like, for me, it was like processing all the things that was happening, the vicarious traumatization from being in a cab, dealing with people trying to provoke me, whatever. Also great things like storytelling, but it was just like a way of processing. And I think in a way, when I was younger, I used to journal, like when I was probably until I was 23 or 22, I used to write, keep and write in journals. And then I stopped, I stopped that from some reason. And then this became like a journal, like of just emotions, experiences, and just kind of just whatever I was feeling, whatever I was experiencing, I just kind of worked through it by being in front of the sewing machine for a couple hours, a few hours, 10 hours, eight hours, whatever. And then through, by going through a bunch of machines, because uh, cheap sewing machines, like using the <laughs> so I was trying to put thicker material, You're like, whoa, this won't work anymore. And then it was like, again, like, I want to buy a new sewing machine, but I need an industrial machine because I burned through motors on these cheaper ones. Mm. Oh, a thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. But then like realizing I'm worth it. I can spend a thousand dollars on a sewing machine because I know I'm going to use it every single day, you know? So this became this. And then over time, like, as it moved down, um, I was thinking a lot about Elanatsui and kind of wall sculptures, like just why does something have to lie flat? Like I rarely experience things that are flat. So I just want to have these projections. Also, it was like tactile, where I've, I've talked about this before in other places where a lot of it was just creating tension by pulling these heavy pieces of fabric mm. and sewing them together. And like the, the physicality of actually positioning it under the needle and pushing it through. And some of the pieces that get bigger are like, they're like 75, 50 pounds, but trying to move these giant things underneath the piece. So anyway, it was just, it was just a process. It was just like, like a diary of my driving a cab for six years so so you know just kind of going into you know the history of this had you ever done work with a sewing machine before i'm you know i'm just really curious as to what you know and, and we can we can see that this was like a six-year process for yeah. for this so what 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 made you decide to get these you know these, these scraps of fabric and start putting them together and you know, such this unique way. And it, it's so painterly. It, it's so, you know, it looks like, you know, this abstract painting, um, at least, you know, looking at it on the screen. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I want to know more. <laughs> it's funny. It's like, I feel like there are a lot of different threads, like the way I was talking about, like, oh, I, I, I do a lot of time machine work. So there are going to be a lot of places where I start, but then I realize I have to back up because I missed something. So I'm going to start the story here. So the way I got started sewing was um, I was doing these, <laughs> another project I had after I graduated from college was that I was really into Polaroids. But the hard thing is like the film models is, is always really expensive. Anyway, I lived in Tucson for a second and I found I had a connection at a photo store who would give me exhausted Polaroid film for a dollar a pack. And then I was like, mm. I'm going crazy. And I documented everything, right? Oh, this is this is the place where I like getting free coffee, you know? So that was like a daily practice I had when I was, when I was bike racing. Um, so anyway, I was taking those Polaroids and I was laminating them. And then I remember meeting someone, it was someone I worked with at Spangers in Berkeley. And he was like, he showed me where he was getting these pieces of rubber, like truck inner tube. And then I was like, oh, I can take these Polaroids if I laminate them and I can sew them inside the truck and the tubes and make these little wallets. And so like, I would make these little Velcro waterproof wallets. All, most of my friends have them. Sometimes I would have drawings in the window. Sometimes they have Polaroids. And I kind of just started sewing these uh, rubber wallets by hand. And I had to experiment with like, hey, I got to try different needles. I use expo uh, upholstery thread. I got to try all these different kinds of Velcro. So it started from that. So then, like I said, people encouraging and supporting me. My friend Jeff was like, hey, I see you're sewing these things. And I was making little t-shirts that had like embroidered, like this is, an, this is a bad example, but I would just like sew little pieces of felt onto t-shirts and make like little monkey shirts, a little logo shirts. And he was like, hey, can you do one of these for my friend's um, bike company? And so it wow. just, like, that was, and then I was like, okay, I gotta get a sewing machine. So. Maybe the, the chronology is off, but I got a sewing machine and, and sew these these monkey figures onto the, these uh, tracksuit things that they had. And so then, uh, yeah, that's kind of how I got into sewing. But then before, well, I'm gonna go back in time. Um, so my grandfather, my great grandfather was a tailor, uh, hmm. also Oklahoma. Uh, my, they fled. My grandfather was also a tailor. 
So when I was a child, I remember just going to my grandfather's house and uh, and with the room where I would sleep, there were like three industrial machines. I just remember being like, why are these taking up so much space? You know what I mean? But like, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> but it was one of those things, like, again, I was, I was exposed to it. And like, it was only as an adult, I kind of made that connection, but um, yeah. Was that? But one of the things in high school I learned, I remember from an art teacher at South Shore, was um, just that we did some hand sewing. And so I just remember that, that was a skill I, I remembered. My grandfather probably taught it to me too, but I just remember her teaching me. And that was something I used to repair like bike kits that would get crashed or like, so I always, or pants that got torn. So just sewing has been like a, a part of my life as well. So that I, is, before, yeah. <laughs> That that is absolutely incredible. Um, you know, I love to see it. And so, was this? So, so you were making the wallets first, and then you you basically took this into a huge scale um, yeah. with a piece like this. Yeah, I thought it, I'll, I'll pull something out. If you give me a second. Uh, I'm gonna stop the share real quick while you do that. For yeah, some reason, yeah, I can't yeah. see. Oh, <laughs> can you see me? Yeah, okay. and then oh, I'm gonna again. Can you see me now? Yep, yep. I okay. just disappeared so that we can see oh, you larger. Okay. okay. Yeah. So it was like funny. They always had to have utility. I was like so attached to like things having. Oh, it has to be something. And like this was just that that TV show Lost. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. After, right? The yellow houses, the bomb, and then the plane crash. You know all this stuff. So it was just like a way of selling toys. Some of the some of the wallets were everything. I'll go this really quickly. Well, everything because of cycling. It was like everything from my favorite team at the time, Onse, with the it was a charitable charity for the blind. Just like little simple objects out of the dumpster material, and I would just kind of give these away. Um, T-Mobile because I loved Jan Ulrich and Bjarni Reese. You know, um, and then went through all these phases. It's funny, like whole team or bike stuff, whales. <laughs> yeah, just like everything. You know, it's like. Uh, but then they're like, I was so into like the decorative aspect. I didn't even. This is like not really functional as a wallet, but it's like I just love like just the like the playfulness of like making things that are recognizable. Um, but then I realized, like I said, over when we talk about progression, over time, I accepted the fact that it was kind of like there was this tension. Like I felt like art couldn't just be art, or my art couldn't just be art. Uh, it's almost like I didn't accept myself as an artist. Um, I felt like it had to be something. It had to be something that people could understand. And so a lot of times, I think I just made things that were objects. Um, and a couple of things, like you'll you'll. If I talk, if I show, if I can find one of, a lot of the pieces were like, I would make into these backpacks, but they were like crooked because I don't, I don't like measuring sometimes. But I was mm. like, it was really, it's almost too beautiful to be a backpack. You're like, it has embroidery of like, uh, Richard Verrank who won the red, 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 uh, sorry, won the polka dot jersey at the Tour de France like multiple times. You're like, this is too nice. You know what I mean? Like, this is gonna get. <laughs> so I would cut them up. I'm like, I gotta take this part. Maybe I have to give, create, have little panels. So, yeah, it was just like that was the weird acceptance. Like, it doesn't have to be something. Mm. It's okay for it to be art. But that was that was my own. It was the opposite of what you were talking about. It was kind of like the the person that told me that I should make art was me. It wasn't other people. You know, so that was my own thing because I was like, I, I want to go to college and be uh, something else, you know? So it's maybe because even like a reveal with myself is just seeing how hard my parents' lives were because they were artists, you know? Yeah, and for so, sure. Like, as a result, you're like, that's the trauma of like, man, I can't have my life be that, even though it became that, but like, I got to do something else. And that actually eventually like led to me. Like, even though I loved art, I couldn't go to graduate school for art because I couldn't mm -hmm. be an adjunct for 15 years, you know what I mean? Or, and have all this pay. So eventually when I decided, I knew I had to go back to school, uh, which led me to, to, to pursue like uh, psychology and counseling. Yeah, that was a lot. Yeah, and, and then in a lot of ways in the art kind of functions for, for, for that on purpose for you, right? Because yeah. you're, you're not necessarily, you know, I think I think on uh, at least in the artist studio, 
the vast majority of the artists that that I interview that I speak with are expressly making art for the market. Yeah. And my my assumption and and then kind of based off of some of the things that you said that's not necessarily uh your your reason for creating work you're you're not like you even said before you're like i'm not necessarily just looking to get that check from selling uh, the work so but it's another piece of that too because i think then some of the challenging experiences i had working with galleries were like it's kind of ties in with blm is like who are you to tell me what my time's worth, dude? Mm. You know what I'm like, you don't get to tell me a, a piece I spent 800 hours on is worth $200. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's what I like the idea of like, I'm not doing it for money. It's like, I'm doing it because I need to do it. I like doing it. But like, I don't, I don't have to sell. You know what I mean? I'm not, I don't have to sell if I don't want to sell. So I like that, that strength is important to me, but it's, 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 it's been a challenge, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it's also like finding galleries of people like joel and rena who are just like this they the the prices they 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 put out there are like aligned with what i think it's worth and they see it and so like joel i'm really thankful to to work with other people out there too but jeff too like i'm really thankful that people see the value and 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 that's how hard like bringing this blm is like it's something i think about all the time is we shouldn't have to remind people that our lives are worth worth anything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I, I shouldn't have people devalue my work because i don't have an mfa or i didn't go to whatever school like i'm valuable my life my work is valuable my life Amen. Is yes and the market doesn't determine like what my time is worth so mm -hmm. and that was a weird thing with driving a cab was when when i was thinking about like sometimes with pricing it's like it would take the amount of time i worked on a piece i would like i would make this amount of money amount of money driving a cab <laughs> you know I mean? yeah yeah yeah, like, yeah. It's less than that no sell <laughs> and i was like I, it was a hard hard job and i was like i can't sell it for less than that i read the driver cab for the weekend you know <laughs> you know exactly so that, exactly that's something that comes up a lot is like how do we assess our own value independent of art markets so like what what is my time what is my life worth worth who determines that me or other people or is it kind of like a weird balance you know i i, I think it's always i think it's always balanced and i think there's there's always you know the, the issue becomes even more exacerbated when the work enters the secondary market yeah. <laughs> and other people are, are are trading it and making lots of money off of it and none of it trickles back to you yeah yeah and i was like that's that that's that's heartbreaking you know yeah yeah it's 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 an inter interesting thing um and yeah i i love that i think you're really unique in that i think um you know so many of the artists are just that i speak to get get kind of caught up in the art market you know and i kind of hate it hate to put that put it that way but then you know the, the market starts to dictate what you make you know how often you create you know the numbers and and so then you also start to see for some artists uh, kind of a shift where that passion you know um and that self-exploration through the art starts to fizzle a little bit and i noticed kind of going through your process and through your works which i will get back to i promise <laughs> in just a second but i'm just like i'm loving this conversation to hear about this um you you don't you don't really do that um your work changes as you dictate it to change um rather than it coming from a secondary source that's telling you you've got to keep making these pieces out look like blue because yeah. the market is going crazy yeah. for them, you know? And then it's funny, I, I, I guess I forget that it was indirectly. Uh, like I had a commission to do a bunch of bags for our company. And I realized they wanted like 300 bags. I was so thankful. Wow. I was like, oh my God, thank you. I had this opportunity, but just, I realized just like doing the same thing over and over again. Oh my God. I was like, this is not for me yeah 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 <laughs> hired a friend of mine to help me finish it because i couldn't do it i was like i this is not what i want to do like sit in a room and make the same thing over and over again um at least in terms of being creative i it would be great yeah if i were enterprising i could have been whatever a big bag maker but like yeah just in terms of like being creative and being for me being authentic and it's like what is my story where where am where am i in this work number one um, and I think for me to be in the work, it's like, I need to have agency, volition, choice, mm. you know? And that's that's been kind of like one of the challenges I feel like collaborating and doing commissions is like, who's, whose voice is in my head? 
Is it this yeah, guy yeah. or is it someone else? And when it's someone else, it becomes like a lot of noise and, and hard for me to, to work. I, I, I hear that. I'm going to get back into sharing. Um, <laughs> so let's just see. Uh, okay. For some reason, my screen still disappears, but it's okay. <laughs> I don't know why it's doing that. Um, so yeah, let's let's just keep it moving. Oh, I love this okay. piece. Yeah, this was this was this was like one of the pieces where it was it was oh, a backpack. Whoops. Oh, sorry. This is the piece originally that was a backpack. Like I was like, oh, oh my god, look at this awesome backpack I made. And then that was this is the one. This is the one where I was like, no, Mansoor again, self talk, Mansoor. No, this can be a wall hanging. And then a friend saw it, my friend Jeff, and he was like, do you want to be in a group show? And I was in 2015. And I was like, yeah, I'll be in a group show. And then that's what kind of got the ball rolling with like, yeah, I can show, I can show artwork. I can show things. It can be, it doesn't have, quilts don't have to be perfect. Like with mm. these men, they don't have to be perfect. It can be whatever. It doesn't even have to be a quilt. It's just like, this is a thing I do. And so, yeah, this was like pivotal in terms of like me taking, showing art a little more seriously. Nice, nice. Uh, we're gonna go through a couple, and your 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 style shifts, and and that's one of the things that I really enjoy is how, you know, um, how from one piece to another, it it it, I, I can see the connection to it. You know, I don't have a problem being like, oh, this is a totally different um, artist. You know, between the pieces, but the language that you use, um, the the shapes, the colors. Um, the references that you make don't necessarily stay the same from piece to piece. Um, right. This one again was the infancy, like using darting, like getting to create more uh, like high relief from the wall. And again, referencing like streets, diagonals. And also, to be honest, I was really in love with this fabric. I only had a small piece of it, it was from scrap, the floral, the blue and yellow. And it was just like, I just love this fabric. And it was like, I only had a little bit of it. So it was like really fragile and it was a small piece. <laughs> sometimes, mm. sometimes they like, sometimes the pieces are, are playful. Sometimes they have meaning. Sometimes it's just like, man, I just feel good. I just feel silly or I just feel like, I just want to share. I just, I just feel the need to do this thing. And that's what I do. Awesome. And then I love, you know, I know that this one was a study but the three-dimensional quality of this one, how, how the fabric is bunching up and coming at us. Um. Yeah, this again was a study, like this was a period of time, like in 2015, like after I showed that green one, where it was, it was, it was still trying to figure out, like I wanted to make these forms, but I, I wasn't sure how to, I was trying to investigate, like how do I, how do I support them without collapsing? Because then this one was more like a pillow, so it's filled with batting. And I did uh, later ones there were, like I said, with the darting and quilting and or I created armatures like made out of plastic, but I, I didn't, it was something about it like quilting, like I didn't choose it because I like quilting, but it was like quilting where like pack the most material and compress it because I have these uh, industrial machines where I can compress it where it's like rigid, the fabric becomes rigid and so it'll hold the form. Um, and that's how I came to quilting. It wasn't like, oh, I, wanna, I like quilting, but also like, again, I, I guess it all kind of comes to it all kind of ties in to like decorate I like the decorative component of quilting and it, it's functional because like the quilting is not de both decorative and it compresses the fabric so I can create these armatures and, and structure it's gorgeous absolutely gorgeous and brilliant I mean you know also kind of you know taking the tools that you're using and then and then making it work for you not fighting against the material yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm assuming with the quilting, it's, you know, to, to get it to hold the form, it's, it's the stitching is closer together. Is that, yeah. is that what's yeah. happening? Yeah, it's like, um, so I'm holding just a piece of batting from my floor. Um, so you can, I can get like, I have a sewing machine that'll sew through like this, this much material. Mm. And so when this batting is can, compressed, it's like really rigid. And so if I fold it and I've used like other, like more rigid kinds of fabric, it, it's like hard, it's like hard. So it'll hold the form, like these shapes I make, it'll hold the form just by compressing, compression. Wow, that's so cool. 
Um, and then, you know, so, some of these pieces start to have have these these stories. And and this this is one that, that has really intrigued me with the green path, because I, I, I think about you traversing cities. Um, yeah. And that's that's what comes to my mind. But I don't know if I'm going too much into <laughs> your, your own story. Oh. It's still like a journey, right? So this one was interesting because this was a period of time, 2016, I'd, I'd gotten a master's in counseling, um, but I still find myself without a job because I didn't have a license, right? So I still, mm. to get a license, you have to do internship hours, which often means you're working for free or working for $13 an hour, which I did, which I found completely traumatizing because I was working, a lot of, often the students I worked with were people who were suffering from poverty. And then mm. I was experiencing poverty and I worked to change my life, but I was still in deep poverty. Um, not deep poverty, but poverty. And so this was like me trying to get out of that. Like just figuring out, I was like trying to figure out a way out of this. Like, how do I change my life again? I worked really hard to change my life. Now how do I change it again? You know, which was like exhausting. But I was also at the time I learned about Yanga uh, during the 15, I think it was 1500s, early 1600s. Um, slave trade brought Africans to Veracruz, Mexico, but um, escaped to the mountains. You know what I mean? And I was thinking about what did it be to me? A maroon, you're in a place, you don't know it, but you just know you want freedom. Freedom is calling you to leave. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so just going. And so that's that's what I was thinking about. It was like just those two things. And it was like, I'm gonna make a piece. And it was like it just the stories kind of formed, just like I just started taking fabric, folding it. This piece also has uh components of some earlier pieces that were unsuccessful that I cut up that I integrate mm. into this piece. So sometimes like things don't work out, I save them. I have a box that's full of like, not discards, but like, this is for the future, you know? Like it's not yeah. working now, like either compositions, color, it doesn't work, I trust myself. And so I'm just, it's good for something, but just not right now. So this has like some discards in it from my own stack and, and just it was like eventually figuring things out, but it took me a little while, like this path. I eventually found my destination. It just took me a little while to get there. Wow, that yeah. Now, now this is quickly becoming one of my favorite pieces. <laughs> you know, I th I think yeah, knowing the story is really really helpful. Um, um, it, it's 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 the the piece that almost exists as you know documentation of that time yeah. um, that yeah. you were going through. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. For me, it's like the the work itself. It's like like what's my connection right to to this life? What's my connection? To myself do i even know myself what's happening in this world right here near me around me so and that was like break talking about the blm thing and and just the summer that was that was like a lot of soul searching for me too you know just mm. like, what am i doing is this just the same old stuff you know because we went through this stuff before like so some of the work i did for uh sf arts commission there's a piece that's kind of about that about so this way yeah i'm I, I'm I'm curious in your choice of materials. You know, you've got truck tarp on, in this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, uh, no, go ahead. I don't know. I, I just I was just wondering about that that specific material and and you know what brought you to introduce that into the, this piece. So truck tarp, a lot of times the way I use it is um, it's backing, so it's to add rigidity to the piece, like in mm. addition to the compression of what of the batting like the truck tarp is used to add rigidity when I'm, when I'm constructing these pieces. Also they're um, like racing tires. Like when I raced road bikes, I really liked using uh, these clinchers called Axial Pros. And they're little green, they're like the little green loops on the upper right side. And so it's just like all these things, but it was like just the, co the colors, you know, like of course drawn to fluorescent green. I think I had a friend, Kelly Defiat, who was using a lot of fluorescent colors at the time. And I was like, I like fluorescent colors too, but it was like, just I just love the way it popped. Also teal was like one of my favorite colors. Um, I don't know, yeah, it was just, it just all kind of just happens. And it's like, like if I bring it back to cab driving, even though I haven't driven a cab in like uh, seven years, but it's just like one of the things when I first started driving a cab that I remember there was a, I was giving a, a ride to a guy who drove for Luxor, I drove for Yellow. And he was like, I was taking him to the yard for a shift. And he was like, you're a new driver. One thing I'm gonna tell you is let the cab drive itself. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't go around thinking I'm gonna make money. You just like trust what you're feeling. Like I trust myself, my intuition, you know, where is this coming from? 
where am I going? You know, it's cool, but just let it happen. So just letting it happen, you know? Mm, I, I love know, it. Trying to be cheesy and using another line again, but one of my favorite lines from, you ever listen to that DJ Shadow introducing album? Oh my gosh, it's one of my favorites of all time, but okay. yes. <laughs> okay, one, one quote I'm going to reuse from our previous talk. I just remember that, that drummer and he's talking about, he's like, the music comes through me. I don't create mm. the, music, the music comes through me. So it's like, how am I putting myself in a space where the music or the art can come through me? You know? So. All right. All right. <laughs> Bringing in some DJ Shadow Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love that album. That's yeah. that's one of the ones that I still have on CD. I, I'm oh, not, not afraid to say that I um we have a we have another comment coming through from Lynn on Facebook. I love this use of quilting to create other forms. Um she's a fan of Bisa Butler for the same reason. Quilting to make painting. It makes me happy to know uh there's topographical art. I agree. Thank you. Yeah. Thank yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for that. Um, this this is another one of the pieces that I just you know we, we've got that path kind of coming through here, um, but you know orange and meaning and I I, I make connotations with orange right away and I know this piece oh. has a story behind it so yeah, yeah. I'm curious I, I wonder if orange is the same thing because I think of orange like I think of it depends on the context like in my daily riding my bike around town context it's like orange means I'm gonna see uh, men at work I'm going to see it's caution it's like fluorescent it's reflective I'm about to see like look out you know um, I guess it's kind of like that. It's kind of like, so when I was, again, in that, that space, when I finished uh, that counseling master's degree, and um, I was struggling, I work at this, uh, it's a nonprofit that works with, uh, I had this great job with them, it just didn't pay enough. It was working with families, and um, blended families in particular, like young people who were living with grandparents, uncles, because uh, they were maybe been taken away from their parents. And one of the kids I worked with, um, he just let me know, it was really intense. Like I worked at his home. It was like, we developed all these rituals and systems. And he let me know when I was terminating with him that um, when he first met me, he was afraid of me. Mm. I was like, why? He's like the color orange, you had that orange backpack. I used to always carry this. Oh yeah, it's right here. I used to always <laughs> this orange backpack that's made out, that I made, it's made out of like an old road sign, right? I was like, oh, it's, a, it's great to be seen when I'm riding my bike. Um, and he was like, yeah, I was, I was afraid. Every time you come through me, I was like afraid. Um, and I was like, why? And he said, well, because every time I go see my dad, he's wearing an orange jumpsuit. Mm. You know? And so um, like when I finished that job, I was thinking about my time with him and a lot about like how we had these stops and starts, we'd have successes. And then uh, I could meet up with him for whatever reason. And so would be like stop starts and then eventually like termination at the end. So it's like incomplete. Um, mm. I, worked, I worked with him for like three three months, but it was just reflecting on that time after I stopped working with him, stopped working with that agency. Wow, wow. Yeah, the, I mean, I think, yeah, that, that was definitely one of the first things that came to mind for me is is thinking, you know, we've got this the show Orange is the New Black that yeah. obviously connects us yeah. with that concept and incarceration and, you know, being in the Bay Area near San Quentin. Um, but yeah, the, the caution, um, you know, but even, even you know, at this time of the year, the orange poppies within the state, you know, so, so many connotations with this particular, uh, yeah. th the shades of orange that you're referencing. Totally. And it was like the way, the way it was constructed too, like I meant for it to be kind of a shield, right? Cause it was like blowing out and I was like, oh, it's gonna be kind of a shield. Hopefully some of the work we did, he can build that shield around him. You know. Oh wow. Wow. So living in over in Visitation Valley. Um mm. so, yeah. Yeah, not 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 an easy way. I'm gonna show just two more pieces right now. Um yeah. because I'm gonna talk about some other stuff <laughs> before we wrap up. I have some questions coming through. Okay, this one is just really simple. I think this was one of the first ones that I did 
uh, I was trying to, because I got, I, I have a habit of like working with mo monochrome at least a long time ago, like uh, with blue, then orange, it was like addictive. Like you just like, I only work in black and white. It was really hard to see color. I was like really afraid. I, I was like, this is like me being honest at this period of time. I was like afraid of trying new colors. And so it was still thinking about aerial views. It was thinking about aquatic park. It was thinking about stuff like that, but it was more about not the finished piece itself, um, but it was like more of like being okay with using other colors. Like mm. everything doesn't have to be all green with blue. Everything doesn't have to be orange with a little bit of green. It can be whatever. So it was like, again, this is more like more for me, it means about like letting go. It's about like taking some chances, like still being afraid, right? The upper right is like me holding on to the past, holding on to what's familiar. And then the red is like, hey dude, you need to change, man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to be the blue guy the rest of your life you need to do something about it you know so um yeah that's what that's what this is about it's gorgeous absolutely gorgeous <laughs> Thank you. uh and then i this one is just the one that just blows my mind <laughs> plus it's gigantic 192 <laughs> inches across <laughs> so. yeah man i got it i got it i moved this one i moved into a new this new studio and I was like doing a thing. It was like, I, again, it's like, it's playful, right? Like not this piece itself, but just my way of working where I just got to this point where I was like so excited to be working in the studio when I was downstairs. I was like, I'm gonna fill the wall. And then like, I came up here and I was like, wait, the wall is twice as wide. <laughs> but I'm gonna fill the wall, man. You know, but um, seriously, <laughs> not just filling the wall, but it was like, why not make something big? Why not make the biggest thing I've ever made? I'd, mm -hmm. I'd never made anything. I mean, like from fabric, I'd never made anything this big. Um, so, but it, it kind of grew this big. So it started out by just finding some old um, children's soccer shoes on the street. And that's the center, the three Adidas. They were Adidas soccer shoes. And so just, I started this, I had some process, process pics on Instagram where I just like started out, I didn't know what it was gonna be. And I would just like start out, it's in, uh, oh my God. There's like an orange triangle in the center right and then they're like two sets of shoes so it started mm -hmm. there and then it just kind of like just grew and then i remember just talking to people over the course of like maybe the first few months about me making things and i remember having this guy this conversation with this guy mark kate who works over at a latin american club <clears throat> and he was talking about nihilism right and i was talking about like what do what do poor black people experience. I think about, I was I was thinking about like what is this this like kind of fatalism that I was seeing in like some of my students when I worked at this alternative school up on the hill. And I was just thinking about this move towards like self-destruction, right? But where does that come from? Who's telling them this? And why is that seen as an option, right? And so this was kind of like reflecting on that as I was like working the first year at that school and just seeing this stuff happen over and over again, thinking about mm. what's my role in interrupting it. Um and just, I don't know, it was just like, like I said, it was a meditation. It was just like, I was coming here every day working on it. Uh, I didn't know how to connect the pieces. So a lot of it was disjointed. Like the way I worked on this big piece was like, I would start putting these little panels on the wall and then I'd start arranging them. And then sometimes they would work, sometimes they wouldn't. And then I would commit to putting them together. So it was a lot of addition, subtraction, and then a lot of like comp composing. Sometimes it doesn't work. So, and it was just like I said, a year and a half of me kind of figuring things out, going back to school, getting a staph infection because I was so stressed out. Um, oh man. All, all kinds of craziness, you know what I mean? Like it was like so much stress because it was like, this was the period of time when I just remember now, it was, it was I was going back, I'd had the counseling master and I went back to get a, um, a counseling credential at SF State. It was a one year program. So I was like in school, I think three or four classes a semester. And then I was like interning at a middle school and then interning at a high school. And on the weekends, I was working at a bike shop to make money. This is, the, yeah, this, this is all you struggling hey, the, the internships where you're not paid. It was like kids stuff. And then it was my own stuff. And it was just like, boom, it's like, I gotta have something, you know, I gotta have a way to release, release this stuff. Wow. All, so, so all this beauty in here. So, so, you know, it's, you've got the, the basketball and soccer shoes. I'm assuming that those are covered. They're, they're embedded within the fabric, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So they've been cut up. So let's say like even, I would never, oh, here's, so it'd be like, a, let's take a shoe that I found on the street here. 
It's just like separating the upper from the, sh the shoe and then cutting into smaller pieces. And there's uh, like, you know, like, let's say this is that green path piece. I would just kind of like integrate it, whatever. But like, so when I cut it up, you would never know it's a shoe. It was just like, mm, got it. it. Okay. I'm making it to a small square or a small piece. Take it, uh, make it, cu cutting it into a small piece. And, th and then you've got this dried botanicals. Are those inside of the fabric yeah, or? Inside the piece. So one of the things a lot of people who know me is like, I love smell. I love smell. Mm. It was like, especially important when I thought about driving a cab, right? Because people get, I know some people get in my cab and it smells funky. They would act funky. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was like, I can't use a tree. I can't use the stuff. And I, what do I like? I like natural smells. And so I used to buy that spray that they had a rainbow that was like, Oh, do we get kind of? Oh, I got that spray of rainbow that was like eight dollars a spray, and I realized I can make my own. And so I started making my own sprays, and then I started collecting. Drop. When I first moved to Berkeley, I, there was a rosemary bush near my house, mm. and I rub my hands against it and keep rosemary in my pocket. So I just always love smells, and it's like I always think about smell and memory. Smell like taking me back to places. Like when I rode around in the, near Heron's Head yesterday, it's the smell from the rendering mm -hmm. plant, the concrete plant, but it's very unique. You're like, oh. This is this this smell is unique to this place, and I I love it even though it's awful smelling. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and so like yeah, are the dried botanicals you know, I I mean I think of, I, I think of them as having some also some other, yeah. It's like, besides the olfactory, so some other yeah, yeah. Like, functions and properties. Like grounding. I I oh my god. What uh, okay? I have a bag full of dried plants over there. I have some drying behind me. They're everywhere, like wherever I'm at. I even, I have one of these secateurs, like, so I can- Nice. <laughs> so it's just for me, like I usually saw into little sachets, like when I'm at work, it's like, okay, are you being calm right now? You know, when I'm in meetings, but it's like, yeah, just a grounding tool. Like, where are you? Where are you going? What do you see? What do you smell? I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. I wanted to I wanted to give us a few times. I don't see any questions in the Q&A. If folks want to put them in there, we can get to them. But I also wanted to give us a little time. You you had offered at the beginning to maybe take us on a little tour. Oh. Are you still up for that? I'm still I'm like, man, no, I'm totally vulnerable. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep it off the floor. Off the floor. So, uh, it's a working studio. We understand. Yeah, so, oh, this, uh, there's a lot of stuff. Okay. So that's, that's where I'm working on some stuff. <laughs> oh, um, I love this. You have a window right there. That's yeah. awesome. Here are some other things I'm working on for some other projects. I'm going to keep those fast. And then <laughs> like, those are my machines. Don't, don't, you don't want to give it away too much. Huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's, that's some other stuff. So it's a, it's a nice, it's a awesome space. Sorry to be so like short. Um, about that. Oh, oh, that, oh, yeah. that, 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 that's okay. We understand. We understand you. You have um, some something. Uh, you, you've got a, sh a show coming up really soon. Or no, you've got one up right now, Rena Braxton. Yeah, I too. Like I have work on a show at um, at uh, the Bedford Gallery in Walnut Creek uh, through Archaeology. Oh. So I have two pieces in that show, and then uh, planning SF Arts Commission and SF Planning. That's like a show we haven't. Uh, I don't know the final date for it, but that's forthcoming. Awesome. And Arena awesome. Branson, the Rena Branson show at um a Minnesota Street. Okay. So I'll make sure that we get all those in the chat for for everybody. Um and then are these all new works that, that are gonna be uh, shown? Yeah, or are these so, yeah, SF Arts Commission is new works that never been seen except on here for a second. Um, <laughs> for, a, for, a, for a split second, we got we we gotta we for gotta close, for my closest friends. Uh, and then, uh, Bedford Gallery is work from two years ago when I was an artist in residence at Recology, and that's the piece that's about. Um, we, we, you and I were chatting about this. I saw your post about it about uh, black pain profiting off of black pain. So that's storytelling, but it's it's for me it's it's weird because it's my own family story and. Uh, uh, fleeing violence in the Jim Crow South in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Meridian, Mississippi in the 1920s, early 1920s. Um, also, uh, what else? Yeah, those are those those are those two pieces. But yeah, the 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 piece of Bedford Gallery, that's one of my favorite works I've ever done.
about the, it's like my connection to my work, my family story. Uh, it's abstract, but it has meaning, you know? So yeah, that was something that, like I said, I'm so thankful I had the opportunity to be there. And uh, that, that, that is awesome. Are those pieces uh, available? For sale, oh, for sale for purchase uh, the, the one the one the, the family history one that i don't know that's that's a weird one i kind of i mean i guess best case scenario for me would be like do sable museum wants to acquire that yeah. <laughs> or yeah. like a museum in tulsa or something like that that would be like my dream because i feel like it should be seen by the it should be seen you know. I hear that. I hear that. So museums, hopefully so there's there's some museum uh, curators who have an acquisitions budget out there. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that would be guest kiss in RL. And it's like, for the future, it's just like, I don't know, I just like for a lot of the work that I do, like, I, it's, it's a lot of energy. It's like a lot of emotional labor. So some of the, mm -hmm. like I said, it's good to have a break, right, to do this stuff that's emotionally challenging, and do stuff that's like fun as well. And so I think people were talking about the, but I think things for me, things that are often fun usually become more challenging as time goes yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, so exactly. I, I don't know if you saw those dolls I was doing on the, the web. Um, I was doing dolls and then my father got really sick and I, he's like, he was a challenging person to be around sometimes later on in his life. And so I had to make these dolls to help me heal. So they were like, they had a little pocket so I could like process what I was going through with him. So I'm gonna put your, uh put your website in the chat for everybody. Um, Cause it's a, it's a little, uh, it's, it's a, it's a little challenging to find. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, is that intentional? Is that intentional? Yeah. What, well, yeah. Yeah. What, what, what is, what, what is the well blah about? <laughs> uh, well, but I don't know. It's weird. Cause I was, I think when I, I was always saving Monster and Arula for like, man, I'm going to have adventure camp. And I want that to be the <laughs> thing, you know what I mean? Monster and Arula, adventure therapy, riding <laughs> bikes, going on hikes, having fun. So I want to save that URL for, for that, you know? <laughs> that, never, that didn't happen. Uh, so I chose Whale Blah because at the time I was really, it sounds like Narula, but different. And at the time I was really into um, Greg the Bunny. You'd ever see that TV show, Greg the Bunny? Uh, I I think maybe my kids have been watching that. <laughs> no, 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 it's it's like it's like a parody. It's like the Muppet Show before adults. It was briefly on on Fox, and there was a uh, a character supposed to be like Count the Count on Sesame Street, but his name is uh, like Blah Count Blah. <laughs> uh, I was like I love whales and Blah, whatever. That's uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, I I I do want to ask you another question before we go. I'm just you know um. You know, can can you can you mention which artists have been the greatest source of inspiration for you? Someone someone uh, mentioned uh, a little bit earlier Bisa Butler, but uh, you know, probably not. I wouldn't say an inspiration because you two were kind of making work at the same time. Uh, I I can't. It's hard for me to point to a particular. Like, I feel like it can be both artists and non-artists. It could be like Joe Frank, right, the storyteller. It could be my mom, the storyteller. It could be my dad, the painter. It can be Geez Ben, it could be Ella Natsui, it could be my friend Jeff, it could be Kim. It's be my, I think mostly my influences. Like I was thinking about two people as I was riding my bike to my studio to talk to you. And, and I feel like every day or every other day I meet people that inspire me that aren't necessarily artists. And Dimitri, thanks for being one of those people today. And it was like the Oropeza brothers, like one's a planner, the other's a painter. And I was like thinking mm -hmm. about how beautiful they are to me and they inspire me. Like my friend Amnon. Chris Solars, you know, like, I feel like it isn't just artists, it's like the way I feel. It's like, who helps me get through the day, the mm. week, the month, my life, you know? Those are, even though visually, like, of course, like I, I write really like Richard Mose's show, even though I thought it was challenging in some ways, but I saw him at the moment. I love the, the sound design. And I forgot mm. the last name with the sound design. And that was like so powerful. And that's what made me want to do music too, was like, I want to make sound. So I feel like I'm not answering the question, but I feel like, I mean, I try to make, I try to be open to meeting people that are going to inspire me. Not necessarily just artists. I feel nice. like the, the work is more than just like about the visuals. It's like about the content and me. And as long as I'm like keeping myself healthy, safe and being inspired, like the work will come. Mm, I love <laughs> that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's 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 a great uh that's that's a great note for us to end on. Um but yeah, 
while well, I'm saying that, do you have any last things you want to you want to tell um, folks about? How much time we got? No. <laughs> 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 like act as like a soliloquy. Um, no, I was just say thank you so much for having me. I'm honored, deeply honored. Um, oh, same, same here. Thank you so much for agreeing. I've been wanting to talk to you for a long time, so uh, you know, not, not, next, next excuse to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, usually, I'm pretty hard to find. So you were uh, good job. You're a detective. Good <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 you're not, you're not as hard as if people start to, uh, <laughs> to, to break it down. <laughs> But it's like the right person asking, right? So thank you for being the person. I appreciate you. This has been such a wonderful talk. Um, I can't wait to see your work. I'm going to get myself out to Walnut Creek and out to Minnesota Street Projects at Rena Branston to, to see these works. I'm really excited about it. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you for everyone for being here. Um, that's all. I'm, I'm honored, deeply honored, smiling. I can't speak because I'm tongue tied because I'm like so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just want to let everybody know and remind everyone that immediately following this talk, um, when we end the broadcast, uh, the the conversation the conversation if you join us late will be available on Facebook, and then by Friday it will be on Moad's YouTube channel. Um, all right, thanks everyone. This has been wonderful, Mansoor. Have a beautiful day. Can't wait to meet you in person. This uh, hopefully in the near future, yeah. um, and we'll see everybody in a couple weeks. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. All right, take care. Have a wonderful one. You too. Bye bye. Thank you.